I love that, Yanev, because I think the default is don't avoid it because it's critical and it'll blow up later. What you're adding is don't avoid it because it's an incredible test of the relationships of between the founders and a great test of how rational everyone is and how effective they are at arguing about hard things and how self-aware they are about the value they're bringing in the way they think about the world. I mean, I had never quite thought about it that way. And I think that's a brilliant way of testing the co-founder relationship before you go much further. You're listening to The Startup Podcast. This is an educational episode, in-depth masterclasses about the concepts essential to building, running, and investing in Silicon Valley style startups. Whether you're a founder, investor, or operator in a startup, you'll gain insights into the principles that power high growth disruption the same way Facebook, Google, and Uber do it. The conversation starts now. Hey, I'm Chris Saad. And I'm Yaniv Bernstein. And in today's episode, we're going to talk all about the co-founder relationship. We're going to answer all the questions that we hear all the time from you. How many founders should you have? Are all co-founders created equal? How to think about equity sharing, roles and responsibilities, and then finally, and really personal and close to my heart, Chris, is how to manage a founder breakup if it comes to that. All that and more right after the break. Stay tuned. There's the stuff you need to do to grow your startup and there's everything else, HR, IT, payroll, expenses, and more. Rippling handles everything in that second bucket, no matter where in the world your employees are. There's no such thing as a silver bullet, but Rippling kind of is one. No wonder they're growing so fast. Get your first three months free by visiting rippling.com slash TSP. That's R-I-P-P-L-I-N-G.com slash TSP for the Startup Podcast. Whether you're starting or scaling your company's security program, demonstrating top-notch security practices and establishing trust is more important than ever. Vanta automates compliance with SOC 2, ISO 27001, and more, saving you time and money while helping you build customer trust. Plus, you can streamline security reviews by automating questionnaires and demonstrating your security posture with a customer-facing trust center, all powered by Vanta AI. And it gets even better. Just for TSP listeners, you can get $1,000 off Vanta when you go to Vanta.com dot com slash tsp that's v-a-n-t-a dot com slash tsp for the startup podcast to get one thousand dollars off okay yanev before we get into it we're going to talk about the startup podcast pact which asks if you've been listening to a few episodes and getting value from the show please rate us and review us in your favorite podcasting app follow us there and also please subscribe to us on youtube the channel's growing and we're really excited about that and give us a shout out on your favorite social network helps us grow the show, helps us get more guests, and helps keep us motivated and ultimately help more founders like you. It makes us so happy, Chris. I had a founder reach out to me today and say that our podcast fucking changed his life. That's a quote. And I was like, that is so gratifying. And what would be even more gratifying is if you told the world about it. So he's onto that. You you know who you are. It really is incredibly motivating to us to see the impact that we get to have. Okay, now let's bust right into it, Chris. We're talking about co-founder relationships. Now, this is something that often doesn't get enough thought. We've already had an episode about how to find a co-founder, but we're really onto the next bit here, which is really discussing all the questions of how many co-founders you should have. And then once you've actually become co-founders, what are all the difficult things that you need to think about? For example, are all the co-founders equal? What are the roles and responsibilities and the job titles? How to handle splitting equity between co-founders? And finally, and it's something, you know, quite personal and vulnerable, but it's something that happens to a lot of founding teams, which is conflict and eventually the possibility of a co-founder breakup. So how do you prepare for that? How do you manage that if you end up in that situation? I think this is going to be a really fascinating, valuable episode. We've both experienced a lot in this area, Chris. So let's get into the first question. One of the first questions that people have when they think about starting a company and founders and co-founders is how many founders should you have? It seems like a pretty simple question. There's no simple answer. And I would say overall, there are pros and cons. And I thought I'd go through the most typical numbers of co-founders you can have and discuss the pros and cons of each, starting with one, the famous solo founder. And that means that you don't have any co-founders. It's all on you. The advantages of that are relatively clear, starting with the most obvious one being you have the most equity. You're not sharing your equity with anyone. So when you first found a company, you're a solo founder, you own 100% of that. And even as you dilute, you know, you start from that much higher base. 
And the other big advantage, of course, is you get to do it your way. You are the boss of the whole company. You're probably the only employee of the company for a while. You don't have to discuss or agree with other people. You can just kind of make your decisions and it's the ultimate accountability. Those are the advantages of being a solo founder. The disadvantages, I would say there are also two big ones, Chris. They're related, but I think one is practical and one is emotional. And they're both to do with being by yourself. So the practical downside of being by yourself, you have to do all the work, especially at the beginning, before you can hire people, before you can raise capital, it all comes back to you. But even as you get bigger, you're the only person who has that depth of, I guess, connection with the company. You're a single parent, right? Like it's all yours. And so you have to do all the work. It's a really difficult thing. There are so many things that go into being a founder, into building a startup, of course. There's a lot of building, a lot of operations, a lot of sales. And then I think when it gets hardest, Chris, is when you're trying to raise capital because you're out there raising capital and, you know, every founder ever has the first time they've gone out to raise are like, that was a lot more work than I expected it to be. But if you're a solo founder, you still need to keep the lights on. You need to keep the business running. You need to keep building it at the same time as you're raising. And there's no one there to help you. And that, that is really difficult. The other downside, of course, is that it's lonely. Like being a founder is hard. It's hard in ways that are difficult to understand if you haven't done it before, but it's somewhat of a singular experience. And the advantage of having co-founders is you have people to share that with, and that can create a lot of comfort, a lot of solace when things get difficult, which they always do. There is a sharing of a burden that is really comforting. We're humans, we're social creatures. There's that old saying, misery loves company. And so, you know, when, when things get miserable, you have that company, you have those co-founders, but if you're by yourself, that's it. And, you know, you can talk to your friends, you can talk to your spouse, but they're not in it the same way you are. So it can be very lonely and it can be taxing on people's mental health. Firstly, you mentioned this is like being a single parent. And I think that is a really, really apt metaphor and it can be very lonely. And there are just so many jobs being a parent and being a caregiver and being a provider. It is highly desirable that you have one or two other people to help you in your family, in your life, whether it is your partner or your family or your in-laws or what have you, not to take anything away from single parents. In fact, this is to give them all the credit in the world. It is a monumentally difficult and often undesirable thing to do. And the same thing is true for, for startups. I would say also short of being a single parent, short of going to war, short of dealing with cancer or something. Being a, a founder of a company is one of the hardest things you can do in, in the world, choose to do. It's just really, really hard. As you said, Yanev, it's, it's hard to describe how hard it is. It can challenge you to your core about your beliefs in yourself and your beliefs in your competence and your beliefs in your ideas. And you're just dealing with the reality that nobody kind of gives a shit about you at all. And you are in this to, trying to bring your vision into the world through sheer force of will. Now. You mentioned the upsides of being a solo founder. You talked about being your own boss or full control of everything, you know, control being an important word here. It's interesting. I just had a couple of conversations in the last couple of days about partnerships, joint ventures, and how this big strategic player would never want to do more of a strategic investment round. They want to do a, a joint venture because they want a lot of control. And this was a, a US deal. And I had to remind this advisor, this person I was talking to is, you know, in Australia and in small markets. It's all about control because it's a scarcity market with scarcity capital, with scarcity operators, with scarcity buyers. And it's like, when you get into partnership with someone, it's like, well, who's going to have control and who's going to be in control and how do we maximize control? And in the U S it typically is not so much about control. It's about value creation and equity growth. It's about what is the right model and who are the right people to bet on that you believe in who can go run fast, execute well, and create value. It reminded me of that conversation because when you talk about like, well, I want to be the only founder because I want to be in control. No, you want to create a founding team, which maximizes your chances of success of value creation and of equity growth. It's not about control. It's about success and scale and growth. And so I don't think those are upsides. You're optimizing for the wrong things in, in that case. So be careful about that. And then the last you know, reaction to what you said, I think is the reason it's so useful to have a co-parent, to have, you know, one or more co-parents is because you don't want to be the only one invested so deeply with your particular narrow skill set, so that that part of the business is like run by someone who's deeply invested, emotionally committed, and has the moral authority to make quick 
sudden agile moves. And then other parts of the business that the co-founder would typically handle, whether it's, you know, a business co-founder for a technical person or a technical co-founder for a business person, that part is being run by someone with less emotional commitment, with less moral authority, with less agility. And then you end up with a little bit of a lopsided business and a lopsided operational cadence. I think that's fair. I mean, I would say there is some advantage to just having that complete moral and actual authority vested in a single person that the startup and the founder are nearly one and the same thing. I think, especially in the early days, that can be very valuable. You can simulate it somewhat with more than one founder, and, and we'll come back to that a bit later in this episode, Chris, but I think there there is a certain purity, right? Like, you know exactly what you want to build, how you want to build it. You are just going to do it. And, and that sense of like, you and the startup are one. If that is a situation you find yourself in, if you have the skill set aspect of it here, I think that is valuable. It reminds me of like George Lucas making the prequels with nobody there to tell him he's full of shit. Oh, Jesus. Right? Yes. Like, you know, yeah, having full authority is great. If you're an incredible contrarian thinker who is right more often than not, who has, you know, great perspective, who has great motivation, who can see around corners and you've done this five times. But like, Yanev, you, know, you and I, you know, we're co-founders of this startup. How often do you call me on my shit and I call you on your shit, right? Yeah, no, it's true. But the difference is that I'm right and you're wrong. Well, let, let, let's say for the sake of argument, I'll give you that, okay? We can commiserate, we can think through problems. There's a reason why Y Combinator, Silicon Valley, you know, generally VCs, the smart money, they're generally looking for teams of two, maybe three or four, mostly two founders. I think that yep. historically speaking, there are exceptions to every rule. Every pattern can be broken. There are examples I'm sure everybody can give of great single founders. Just generally speaking, a game of probabilities I think being a solo founder, especially your first time out, is something that's less desirable. One other advantage occurred to me, it's a kind of a funny advantage, which is you don't have to find a co-founder. And we have a whole episode on finding a co-founder, but I think, you know, one of the things that goes wrong in startups, if you pick a shitty co-founder, or, you know, shitty sounds bad, if there is a poor fit between co-founders or between a co-founder and the business being built, there isn't a shared vision and so on. And then there can be a lot of founder conflict and things can go to shit. So if you're solo, that is less likely to happen. Well, let's, let's talk about that for just a moment. So if you want to think about picking your co-founder, you should definitely go listen to that episode because we talked about how to make sure it doesn't go to shit, how to make sure you do founder dating properly. You get to the root of these misalignments quickly and all this kind of stuff. So definitely got to pick your co-founder well. But it is worth noting here that if you are passionate about an idea, you should not let the lack of a co-founder stall you. You should be doing as much as you possibly can to build that business while keeping an eye out for a co-founder, for somebody who you can pull in, who's meaningful enough to the business that you give the honorary title of co-founder to, and you give them a meaningful piece of equity. So don't ever let the single co-founder thing be an excuse not to keep making progress on the business. That's a big mistake. Like you said, Chris, I think two co-founders, perhaps a bit like two parents or, or two people in a couple, that is the default normy way of doing things. And, you know, I think the advantages we've already started covering, which is that you have that sharing of the load. And again, very much like parenting, right? You can specialize to a certain degree. You can do things together, but also you can balance each other out. One person can call the other one on their shit. If one person is unwell or down, the other person can step in and help them, right? Like, you know, in, in my personal life, my wife and I have always had this saying, one up, one down, right? So the, the idea is if one person in their life is struggling for whatever reason, having a difficult time, it's natural for the other person to be energized by that, to step in and say, I am here to help you. If someone's sick, the other person steps up. If someone's had a difficult situation in their life, the other person steps up. And I think, you know, having that redundancy and that support network two people provides is just so, so valuable, as you say, Chris. Yeah. And that's the kind of the emotional journey and the intellectual journey. Of course, there's the very practical business reason and journey, right? Which is typically two founders or more, you're literally looking to cover off disciplines and capabilities of those people. And so typically that second founder is good at the things you're not good at. The very obvious and traditional and cliche split is the business co-founder and the technical co-founder. You know, maybe it's a product co-founder and an engineering co-founder. But the point is they're there for you on an emotional and intellectual level to go along on the journey. 
and then they're there for you in terms of a, on a competence level to help you balance your skills and to run a huge chunk of the business with you and make sure that that part's taken care of. Exactly. Now, in terms of downsides, apart from the obvious, you know, dilution of your equity, although Chris, as you said, that's, that's a bit of a scarcity mindset, so maybe not the right way to think about it. I would say the main downside is the potential for conflict. We sort of covered that already a little bit, which is that you are two people who are both very passionate and very invested in building this thing. And if you are not well aligned, and also if you do not have effective strategies for resolving conflict, because conflict will arise, it can spiral and it can lead to major dysfunction in the business. And it can ultimately lead to a founder breakup. We'll come back to founder breakups later, right? So I think if mummy and daddy are fighting, then that sucks for everybody, but especially mummy and daddy, but the whole business suffers from that. So it is so, so important again. Choose carefully when you couple up and then to invest in a robust relationship. I think one of the things that can go wrong is this idea that we're just so busy working on the business that we don't work on our relationship. Co-founder relationships are intense. They are a lot like a marriage, which again, we talked about it in the finding a co-founder episode, but consider that when you get married, you haven't reached the finish line, you're at the starting line. And so maintaining that co-founder relationship as a couple is incredibly valuable and it demands your time and attention and maintenance. And so that's something very much to consider. You're entering a relationship. In some ways it's easier than marriage because if you're doing it right, the KPIs are clear and the objectives are relatively objective and rational and the commercial goals are pretty easy to navigate to a degree, right? If you're doing it very, very well and very intentional. To a small degree. Whereas marriage tends to be a little bit more ambiguous, the goals are less measurable and things like this. But on the other hand, it's harder than a marriage. And I'll be a little crass here because you don't have any sex. You're not having sex with your co-founder. That's right. You're not having sex. I'll speak for yourself, Chris. I mean, sometimes you do. But you know, like there's a lot to be said about the soothing, reparative, restorative virtues of sex in a relationship, right? You can actually make up with sex as a platonic relationship and a co-founder thing. It's, you don't get actually that catharsis. It might be funny to bring that up, but it, it, you know, I think it, it's an important dynamic and it's, yep. it's, it's easier in some ways and harder than some ways in a romantic relationship. So that's two. I would say, yeah, two is a good default to our point, but let's talk about three and four. Maybe I'll bundle these together. They're, they're slightly different. When we have three or four founders, right? We're dealing in, with a different space here. We're going f away from being kind of a single relationship to a constellation of relationships. And remember that the, the way the maths works here is three founders, you have three different pairs. So you have three different relationships plus the group as a whole. So sort of four relationships to manage. With four founders, it's actually like six plus three. It's like 10 different configurations of people that are possible combinatorically within those four. You're much more moving from three and definitely to four to a team dynamic. Also, when you have three or four founders, you really need to be thinking about a, a greater level of specialization. And that's something we'll, we'll talk about in a minute, Chris. But the reason to have three or four founders is really about bringing in more skills. And remember, at the beginning of your startup, you basically you're working for free or for well below market rates. And so one way of really giving yourselves more runway or of, of bringing in great talent early on when you can't afford great talent is to add them to your founding team. That is actually a valid strategy, right? Where you say, we're doing something quite complex. It's going to take a while to make money. We don't want to raise venture capital too early. What we'd rather do is build a committed core team of co-founders who are going to build this thing together. And so it's, it's nearly a different model when you go to three or four. You know, it's like Ocean's Eleven, I sometimes think of it. Like you're looking for all those skills and you want to bring them together. So you effectively have a functioning team building something complex from the very beginning. So, you know, that's, that's a huge advantage. Also, especially when you have three, at least you have an odd number. So in conflicts, you can have a, a certain like majority rules dynamic that can work. Obviously that doesn't apply to four founders, but you know, the real advantage, like I said, is, is getting all those skills in and having an even greater level of redundancy. So when you have three or four founders, if one of them leaves along the way, for example, something I've, I've experienced personally, that doesn't have as major an impact on the business. On the other hand, I think you're starting just a little bit to dilute what it means to be a founder, right? Like, of course, these co-founders are still very, very deeply invested in the business. But when you go from being, you know, just that solo founder or that couple 
who are sort of doing everything together and in lockstep to becoming more of this group and team dynamic, you lose just that little bit of like direct connection between each individual founder and the business. And I think that's something that doesn't get discussed very often, but I've definitely experienced directly. I've definitely seen in other businesses as well. When you're talking about three founders, what you're ideally talking about, again, in terms of competency coverage, the coverage of each of your skills is really a business co-founder, a technical co-founder, and a product co-founder typically. Obviously there are other combinations, other ways that can go, but that feels like the right triad. What I mean by that really is the business person is really all about sales, storytelling, fundraising, being the man on the street, the woman on the street, building the business. The technical person is building the code and the product person is building the product strategy, the positioning, the messaging, and all that kind of stuff. The nice thing about that is you have a tension between the sales, fundraising, storytelling person and the person who actually uses to deal with the product development. So you have that healthy tension between those things and the technical things. To me, that's the, that's the ideal combination of three. I think that about makes sense. And then, you know, there's, there's sort of often operations and so on. And one reason to have four co-founders is because there is a greater spread of skills required in the particular type of business that you're building. Maybe the reason to have four is you're doing, you know, business sales, CEO, growth type, technical product. And then if your business is very, very operationally heavy, you might have an operational co-founder. So that maybe justifies the four. Look, for my money though, and, and this is now skipping ahead a little bit, it feels like you're starting to get pretty heavy at four. I think you might have one or two who are a little bit outsized really early and having an outsized impact on the business. And maybe other two who are maybe like first employees where they have a meaningful piece of equity, but really they're taking the lead of the first one or two. There's just one other downside of four that I've witnessed. Thankfully, not in the four that I was a co-founder of, but once you have four people, that allows you to develop factions. And I think that's actually quite common, right? You end up with two groups of two founders who kind of start to hate each other. And that's even worse and more insidious than just having a pair of founders. If you've got two co-founders who have difficulty with each other, it ends up being much more difficult to resolve it. It ends up becoming quite underhanded. And so it is so confusing for the team when there are four co-founders within which you have a dynamic of two against two, the amount of churn and unpleasantness that causes to the entire organization is massive. I've seen that personally, it's, it's awful. So that's something you really want to watch out for if you have four co-founders. Again, just to summarize this, I think for my money, for my personal taste, I think solo can work if you're very experienced. Two is ideal, especially in a software business, you need someone who understands product and sales and someone who understands the technology. Three, you're pushing it. Maybe, 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 especially if the CEO business guy doesn't know anything about product and you need somebody to help with that. And then to me, four is getting really heavy and you really need to start thinking about this as one or two co-founders and employee number one and two. And that the relationship and the power dynamic needs to be very clear there. I think that's accurate. And it's a good segue to that next question, which is, are all co-founders equal? Now I put equal in quotes, but I think it's an interesting one. It's often this assumption that, you know, you've got a founding team, we're all in this together, we're all equal, we're all the founders. You know, we had this baby together in our throuple, which is strange, but you know, we're all co-parents, right? You don't, you don't ask, are, are the two parents of the child equal? Of course they are. So this is where that metaphor breaks a little bit because all co-founders cannot and should not be equal. And there, there's a few things here. And where I wanted to start, Chris, is with the special role of the CEO, which nearly always, especially early in the business, is going to be one of the founders. And as we have actually discussed in a fairly recent episode, as much as possible, the CEO should remain a founder for indefinitely, if possible. They have a special role in the business that I think, you know, the more time I spend around startups and in startups, the more I appreciate, which is founder is a label, but CEO is a role. And the CEO is the person who needs to be ultimately in charge of the business. What you don't want, and again, what I've witnessed is a, a parallel organization where in the org chart, the CEO is in charge, but then in the back rooms, all the co-founders are kind of equal and they need to agree on everything. That undermines the ability of the CEO to do their job. Also, again, it's very confusing for any non-founders in the business. The CEO is in charge of the business, and that is regardless of how many co-founders there are. Every other founder needs to report to the CEO and that reporting line needs to be real, right? The CEO needs to be the manager of those other founders. Although there are certain business decisions like, you know, very long-term things, you know, maybe about fundraising and so on, 
where all the founders are kind of in it together and making a decision jointly. In the day-to-day -day operations, creating something out of nothing, the CEO is in charge and the other founders are, in that sense, subservient to that person. You know, in my early career, when I fancied myself an entrepreneur and, and not a big co guy, I would kind of deride job titles and roles and I go, oh, you know, I don't need no fancy title or, you know, what's the point of the title? We all get in and get stuff done. And of course, that was a fairly immature and, and I, I would say ignorant point of view. Every younger generation has to learn, Chris. It's one of those things. Right. Job titles and job descriptions are very, very important, both in small, medium, and large companies. And I have met a lot of founders who underinvest, underestimate, do not understand the value of job titles and job descriptions and areas of responsibility, do not respect it, do not apply it, do not live it, do not breathe it. And you're right, Yanev, this, this might seem obvious, but this is not obvious to many founding teams. And I just want to reiterate what you just said. Founder is a label like biological mother or biological father. It is not a role. The actual mother and the actual father, the person parenting and raising the child, that's a role. And you can't lose the label. You can't ever unbecome the biological mother, but you can lose the role of guardian and parent that you can absolutely lose that. And so this is worth repeating multiple times, right? Clarity and specificity of these titles and reporting lines will just eliminate a lot of angst, frustration, and suffering from the founder relationship or the, the relationship between the founders. The way this just very pragmatically could play out is like consulting a board. You check in with the board on big issues. You check in with the founding team on big issues and you debate and you discuss and you argue vigorously, but the CEO makes the call. The rest of the team disagrees and commits. And I would say that's really how a board, a well-functioning executive team and board should be as well, is the board provides governance and oversight and what have you. But when it comes to operational details, you trust the man in the seat or the woman in the seat, the CEO, and you get their back unless you think that they're way off course and, and need to be kind of course corrected. Exactly that. So, you know, that's something I've come to appreciate more and more. Again, I think every generation has to go through their, their sort of collectivist tendency and say, you know, we're all in this together and then realize that reporting lines and power and authority are real and need to be structured well in order to make progress as a collective. That's really, really important. Complete aside, we're probably going to cut this out. I'm so fascinated by that. Like as young people, you know, this egalitarian collectivist socialist ideal gets beaten out of us as we actually have to deal with people in the real world. And like, there's lots and lots of things that Jordan Peterson says that are anything from insensitive to disgusting, but he actually blew my mind when he described the idea that as soon as you just declare something to be good, competence hierarchy immediately emerges of people who are at various levels of effective at achieving that good and competence hierarchies are impossible to avoid. And the only thing you can try to do is minimize their tendency towards tyranny and redistribute wealth or redistribute rewards from the bottom of the hierarchy to the top so that uh, the people at the bottom don't get trampled on. And I was like, oh, fuck, you're right. Because I was like still in my, just at the, at the end of my egalitarian peer-to-peer -peer ignorance. And I was like, oh man, he's yep. right. Noblesse oblige, right? You know, that the, the powerful have a moral obligation to the less powerful, but that obligation does not extend to giving up their power. It's, it's interesting. Over 7,000 global companies like Atlassian, Dovetail, Flow Health, and Quora all use Vanta to manage risk and prove security in real time. Why aren't you? Get $1,000 off Vanta when you go to vanta.com slash TSP. That's V-A-N-T-A dot com slash TSP for the Startup Podcast to get $1,000 off. You know what founders hate? All that back office busy work that goes into operating a company. I'm talking about HR, onboarding, offboarding, payroll, EOR, LMS, IT. The list seems endless. And for each of these things, you have a separate vendor, a separate invoice, a bunch of integration headaches. No more. Rippling is doing something miraculous, building a single all-in-one workforce platform for your global workforce. A single vendor, fully integrated for all your HR and IT needs so you can focus on what matters, building your startup. They even have a special offer for TSP listeners. Get three months absolutely free if you go to rippling.com slash TSP. That's R-I-P-P-L-I-N-G dot com slash TSP for the startup podcast. There are actually two problematic or, or unique aspects of co-founder relationships and roles that I wanted to dig into. 
And the first of these is co-CEOs where you say, okay, you know what? There's two of us and we're both awesome and we've got that 50-50 equal split and we both have opinions on things. And so we're going to run the company together as co-CEOs. That is usually, not always, but usually a bad idea. So I would say the rule is do not have co-CEOs. You need to have one CEO who is ultimately accountable and in charge. And the other person who wanted to be co-CEO has a clearly defined role as not that person. Not the CEO. Now, there is an exception, and I would say it's a relatively rare exception to that rule. And when that exception exists, it can be absolutely beautiful. And that's what I call the hive mind. When you have co-CEOs, the way I see it is it's, there is no divide and conquer. You can't say I'm the co-CEO responsible for X and the other one's a co-CEO responsible for Y. No. Co-CEOs work when you are so attuned with each other. You have the same values, the same decision-making heuristics, the same understanding of the business strategy, the same understanding of the business metrics, that talking to one of the CEOs is like talking to both or like talking to the other. They each have the full decision-making authority and so on. And that works okay because the other CEO would have said the exact same thing. So you are so in tune with each other. You want to have two bodies, right? You're one brain. You just have a, like clones of yourselves walking around. That can be incredibly powerful. Some of the best companies have co-CEOs. But that to me is the only way it can work. Because as soon as there is any daylight between the two CEOs, that will lead to confusion, ultimately conflict between those two people. And conflict between co-CEOs is not something you want to have in your business. Firstly, I would love to meet someone like that who like is so simpatico with me. Like, And no one's simpatico with you, man. You're a fucking psycho. I'm, I'm just a weirdo. Nobody, nobody. Keep that in the edit, Justin. But we're talking about normal people. Yeah, that feels like a, you know, a unicorn situation. I've seen so many co-CEOs when I, since I've come back to Australia, it, it was like, it's just bizarre. Stop doing it. Have more creativity and specificity in your job titles than that. So let me riff on that. Cause that was actually going to bring me to my next point, which is the COO. And this is one that I've got personal experience with, but also spoken to a lot of other COOs. So I think often what happens is you have two people who are like, I want to be generally across all the things that are in the business. I call this person a generalist founder or a general manager, right? They're not responsible for a specific function in the business. They're like, they're across all the things. And sometimes you're like, okay, obviously co-CEOs is a bad idea. So one person's going to be CEO and they're going to be more like responsible for the big picture and the fundraising and the whatever, being the front guy or gal. And then you've got the COO who's more like, running the team and the every day and so on. That's been me in the past. Now, a lot of the time, that is just, again, avoiding a difficult conversation. And what you have is still two people who kind of want to be running the show. And if they're not very, very simpatico, then you're going to end up with a lot of the similar problems as with co-CEOs. Now, you know, there are some advantages, right? At least you have a clear person who is senior and a clear person who is junior, which is why when these things go bad, it's, it's nearly always a COO who ends up leaving the company. Uh, I would say it's a role that has a, a pretty short typical tenure, whether it's as a founder or as a, a, an employee. So the COO as the day-to-day -day person running things, I don't think is a good idea at a startup, Chris, right? Because you don't need two general managers at a startup. That is my view. Unless you have that amazing hive mind, the friction that it causes outweighs any additional productivity that you get from it. So what you should have on your founding team is one CEO, one general manager who's across the entire company, and every other role should have a clearly defined functional aspect right? So you have non-overlapping roles there because it's not a stable role because you are the junior member of a partnership that probably shouldn't exist. And so ultimately the partnership dissolves and the COO leaves. But th there's another type of role I wanted to talk about, which is sometimes also called COO or sometimes called head of ops or whatever. And, and this is what I call the, the generalist founder or the, the kind of the jack of all trades. And this is a person that they're often the, the less experienced person and they just kind of do whatever needs to be done. So the difference between that and the, the type of COO I was talking about before is they don't think they're in charge of everything. It's more like they do whatever needs to be done. They're the jack of all trades. And that can be really valuable early in the company's lifespan, whatever you call it. But you are generally going to be creating some organizational debt down the track, which can be quite problematic, which is... After a while, you don't need a person like that. 
Or if you do have a person like that, it's quite a junior role as the company scales to have a jack of all trades who just does bits and pieces. You don't really need that in a co-founder. And so ultimately, if you find yourself with a co-founder who's not the CEO and yet doesn't have a depth of expertise in any area, you find that they are a co-founder who will probably end up leaving the business at some point. Or being a drag on the business, right? Or being a drag on the business, need to leave the business, right? They, they have a limited, useful lifespan in the business. And we've talked in the past about that's it's fine to have people in the business who will not necessarily last with the business and they can move on. It makes it harder when they're a co-founder. Not impossible. And ultimately, I think it usually does end up happening. But I often, yeah, w when I see a co-founder with the role COO or head of ops, unless it's a very clear operations heavy business and that person is responsible for that, I see like the COO is likely to end up leaving. We should clarify here, right? Because ops is a little bit like platform. It's this overloaded term that means different things to different people. So this whole time we've been talking about ops as like either a generalist that helps with a lot of different stuff or like HR finance, like business operations. And what Yanev just said at the end is important. If we're talking about an operationally heavy business where there is a big component of physically manipulating things in the real world, what you might call product enablement operations. So if you think about Uber, they're like onboarding drivers and riders. If you think about Airbnb, they're onboarding and vet vetting hosts. There's a big real world component, then having someone even at the very earliest stages who is head of product enablement operations in the real world makes perfect sense. But we're talking about the other kind of COO is just managing finance, HR, and other bits and pieces. So there's one other thing on equality, which is equity. And now I mean equity in the sense of shareholding. Should equity be divided equally? This is related to are all founders equal and it's related to, hey, maybe if quote unquote, co-founder three and four are really employee one and two. It's about storytelling and about how these things came together. You know, did four people meet in a bar and invent an idea and then go register a company together and go start that company day zero together? Maybe the founding cap table is, you know, 25%, 25%, 25%, 25%. What's more likely to happen is some of those people will be less competent, less senior, less able to just quit their job and join the others. Something about them, whether it's their value to the group or whether it's the timing in which they joined, will naturally suggest that they should have less equity. And that's particularly true if one or two or three start the thing and one or two or three join later and as a kind of late honorary founder. You know, you can think of an Elon Musk, for example, who joined when the company was worthless, Tesla I'm talking about and is, is essentially the founder of Tesla, even though people like to argue that around in circles. And so, yeah, I think the reality of what happened and sort of the story that you compose around it, I think will suggest the equity and the, and the way that plays out, Yanev. You actually make a really interesting side point, which I think when we talk about the term founder, it is worth spelling out, right? So founders often, but don't always actually found the company. And the literal act of founding is perhaps not the most important act in the company's history, right? So what a founder really is, when that term is used in practice, is a label that is applied to an employee of the company who has a massive equity holding in the company. And I think, in fact, Y Combinator has a, a definition, which is a founder has to have at least 10% equity in the company. I think there's a few other caveats to that definition. So I would say it's someone who has had a outsized, meaningful impact to the way the company was birthed, structured, or its direction early in its life and has a commensurately large equity holding as a result or as well. And I would argue also if the company goes through a massive pivot, which has been supported by or has the involvement of someone else, they might be also considered the founder of that new pivot. If an employee has received an equity grant or has equity that is in excess of 10% without being absolutely fundamentally critical to that company's origins and success, then what the fuck are you doing? Right? Like that, that's a huge amount of equity. You've screwed up. Right. I guess one thing I would, I would say going back to like, should it be equal? Like, yeah, maybe this mirrors the reporting lines and so on is I think the longer I do this, the less I feel it should be equal in all cases. You know, I think if you've got especially two founders with roughly equal backgrounds, levels of experience, again, like, like you and I, Chris, and we're like, we're starting something together, then 50, 50, 
it makes sense. But if you've got a larger team, if you've got three or four, I think it becomes less and less likely that you should have an equal equity split. And also, if you have someone who's clearly the more important, the senior partner, right? You can have the concept of a senior partner and a junior partner. Now you're both founders. But if I've got some incredible technical breakthrough, I've got 20 years of experience in AI and machine learning, I've got this amazing thing, and I'm looking for a co-founder to help me bring this thing to market. That doesn't mean that co-founder should necessarily get 50%, right? And I think if that co-founder is mature and adult, they'll realize that they are there to play a very significant role in the birthing of this thing, but that ultimately it is the other person who has contributed the most value and that contributing the most value should be reflected on the cap table. That makes total sense and what I was alluding to earlier. But I guess another factor here is if one of the founders are contributing cash and or mm -hmm. IP or some other resource... And I find the easiest way to think about this is simply to say, what would we do? What would we grant to each other as founders? Now, the next part of the story, the next chapter is one or two of us invest in the company as like sort of angel investors. And that investment comes with either a note where the valuation will be determined later or a valuation right there. And then they get a commensurate amount of additional equity for that investment. That's the, the way I tend to solve for that problem. Having a conversation about equity splits that are not equal is quite awkward and uncomfortable. And in that sense, it's actually a great early test of your ability to have awkward and uncomfortable conversations as a co-founding group, which is an absolutely critical skill. So don't avoid it. If you, for example, think that you should have more than an equal split of equity, having that conversation with your co-founders and explaining your reasoning and getting them ultimately to agree, getting to an accord where everyone is satisfied, that is actually a really powerful validation of your relationship. So I say, lean the hell into that rather than say, ah, oh, it's too hard. I don't want to rock the boat. So I'll just accept an equal equity split. I love that, Yanev, because I think the default is don't avoid it because it's critical and it'll blow up later. What you're adding is don't avoid it because it's an incredible test of the relationships of between the founders and a great test of how rational everyone is and how effective they are at arguing about hard things and how self-aware they are about the value they're bringing and the way they think about the world. I mean, I had never quite thought about it that way. And I think that's a brilliant way of testing the co-founder relationship before you go much further. And just one other thing on equity, make sure that founder shares vest. There are different ways of structuring this. It's actually often structured as a clawback rather than as a traditional ESOP. The bigger mistakes that one can make, that's a mistake you and I made, Chris, but it's okay because we still love each other, is to just grant equity outright. Because imagine what happens. You have got a 50-50 split and then one co-founder, you know, you have a conflict, a co-founder leaves after six months and they walk away with their 50%. Well, congratulations, your cap table is fucked. You're going to be very resentful and bitter and nobody will invest in your company because half your company belongs to somebody who is not contributing anything to it. You've basically taken half the pie and just like thrown it in the bin. So do not allow that to happen. Founders should actually vest their equity. The assumption is they're there for the long haul, so it shouldn't make a big difference. But when you have a founder breakup or a founder leaving, which is more common than you think, you will be so glad that you have that equity vesting for founders. So that's maybe a little bit more of a tactical thing, but do not overlook this. I guess a side note on this, if you are finding yourself in a situation where you are splitting up with a co-founder or two, and it's really acrimonious, for those people leaving and taking their massive equity with them, you're basically just shooting yourself in the face because you're cratering the company's ability to raise money and to, to move forward. And you're just zeroing out the value of your equity. No matter how pissed off you are at your co-founders, just for pure selfish economic reasons, I would come to an accord with them about having a minority stake. So the value of that minority stake is potentially worth something later. Even if you hate them, they can continue to operate the business and maybe make you some money. Just think a bit rationally yeah. about the long-term plan here. So final thing I want to get to, Chris, and this is becoming a bit of a long episode, but I did want to talk about founder breakups because like divorce, it is much more common than you think, right? So is this whole episode going to have like a, an excuse for us to have a conversation? Is that what's going on? Yeah. Yeah. Chris, I love you, but I can't live with you anymore, man. It's not you. It's me. It's not me. It's you. Okay. So when it comes to founder breakups, like I said, they're, they're much more common than you think. And I feel that they're a taboo and, and it, it is kind of like the thing that I'm most excited to talk about in this episode, because it, it is a bit of a breaking of a taboo. Ultimately, there are many reasons for a founder to leave the business. 
right? It can be entirely for personal reasons. It can be for health reasons. It can also be because their role is effectively redundant. If you have an early generalist person and then eventually the business outgrows them and they might need to leave. But also it can come as a result of conflict or disagreement about ways of working or the direction of the startup or so on. What I would say is you always want to work to repair a relationship where that's possible. But if it cannot be repaired, again, as with a marriage, what you don't want to do is carry a founding team where the relationship is irrevocably damaged. It is not healthy for the business. It is not healthy for the team. Again, the marriage analogy is very apt. So once you reach a certain point where you've made the real efforts that are necessary to, to try to repair the relationship, if it's, a, if it's a relational thing, then it is time for one or other of the founders to leave the business. And it is a big deal, but it doesn't have to be the end of the world. And, you know, this is, this is sort of the secret of startups. If you actually look into, you know, a large number of startups, a very significant portion of them have lost a founder along the way right? You might think of a startup that has one founder, but actually it started with two, or one that has two, but it started with three. And a founder has departed along the way and the, the business has not just survived it, but has continued to thrive. Chris, so I think, you know, the two points I'd make here is invest in the relationship, invest in trying to repair the relationship if it, if it is breaking. But then again, as with marriage, if it's time to call it, call it and then put all your effort into making sure it is amicable and fair and everybody leaves in a position where they're able to move on where the least damage is done to the organization so that you can continue to do what you're going to do and and you know as you pointed out chris when it comes to equity like the departing founder is going to be leaving with equity so it is in everyone's interest to not blow shit up and have the business continue to go well yeah probably the only thing i want to contribute to this part yanev is just a call for maturity, mm -hmm. you know, just, just be a fucking adult. And I'm talking about the people who are staying and the people who are leaving. There is a financial incentive for everybody to deal properly with the business and to not throw anybody under the bus. And there's also just an ethical, moral, kind of like pragmatic human reason to just make it as painless as possible. Do it for the kids, man. Do it for the kids. Do it for the kids. Right. So just disagree, disagree, disagree. But then agree that it's not working mm. and then just find the most fair, least punitive way of parting ways and moving on with your life. And I just, I've seen even recently boards and founders just trying to hurt each other, trying to strip each other of the founder title, trying to send signals to shareholders that are negative or, or punitive. Just cut that shit out. Just be an adult. Grow up. So maybe uh, I completely agree. And, and, you know, maybe the final place to finish is, you know, those of you who are regular listeners will probably be aware that I left my startup circular where I was chief operating officer about six months ago. You know, I haven't spoken about it a lot out of respect for my former team and, and the company, which is an ongoing concern. And the interesting thing is like, I still have a huge amount of love and respect for the team there. We did it that way. We did it amicably. We did it in a, a mature and responsible way. And I remember I was very afraid when we were going to go to our lead investor and, and tell them about this. And there were two interesting things. One is they were, they were surprised that we were breaking up as it were, but they were not surprised in the macro, right? Because I think they come across this all the time. Like an experienced VC will see founder breakups all the time. So this is not like an unusual situation for them. And ultimately speaking to our, our principal at, at the lead investor is like, Thank you for being such an adult about it. That was the feedback I got. It's like, we're sad to see you go, but you know, you're not burning the place down on the way out. It's been done respectfully. It's been done with thought about how to manage the transition for the team. And, you know, once the decision was made that you didn't want to stay at the company, this is a best case outcome. And so, you know, while of course there was plenty of emotion and it wasn't an easy decision, the world didn't end either for me or for Circular, right? And for the team there that is still doing a fantastic job and the company's going from strength to strength. And again, as a shareholder and as a decent human being who had these relationships with people I cared about, I'm thrilled about that. And that's how it should be. Yeah, and, and if you need any additional incentive to be an adult and to be amicable about it, the community is very small. You know, I now have information about people who have been punitive, who've been rude, have been greedy. You can bet your butt that I'm going to share that with anyone who needs to know that I encounter. 
because I need to protect others from them. It is a very small community. Your reputation is everything. And so this is just, it just really, it really matters to be a good human being. Beautiful place to finish, Chris. All right, you know, that was a great one as always. Bang an episode, Chris, a lot of fun. Now, if folks want to find you on the internet or indeed want to work with you, which I know is something that you, you do and you do incredibly well, how do they find you? Uh, yeah, that's right. And if you can learn more about working with me over at chrissard.com slash advisory, and you can reach out to me from there. Or in the meantime, you can subscribe to my newsletter over at chrissard.com slash newsletter. How about you, Yanev? So you can find me mostly on LinkedIn. I'm the only Yanev Bernstein out there, so easy to find. Or I'm on Twitter, now known as X. I'm at Y Bernstein. And if you want to pay me money so I can listen to you talk about how hard it is to be COO, I'm happy to do that too. All right, mate. Catch you in the next one. All right. Have a good one. Bye. Today's episode of the Startup Podcast was brought to you by Vanta. Vanta automates compliance for SOC 2, ISO 27001, and more, saving you time and money while helping you build customer trust. Plus, you can streamline security reviews by automating questionnaires and demonstrating your security posture with a customer-facing trust center, all powered by Vanta AI. Over 7,000 global companies already use Vanta. Why don't you? Get $1,000 off Vanta when you go to vanta.com slash TSP. That's V-A-N-T-A dot com slash TSP for the startup podcast to get $1,000 off.